Thank you for watching this video. Remember that the best way to study is to take practice tests. And if you can't find good practice tests, build your own and learn while you do it. You're using the Learn My Test tool, and you can actually try one of our practice tests by clicking on the link in this description, in the test, in the video description. So a couple, of, we're going to talk about memory today, and a couple of terms you want to know is recall, which is when someone asks you to generate something from memory without any cues or with limited cues to like come up with it on your own. And then recognition is asking you to choose or recognize the most accurate memory, which is like multiple choice tests, you know, that you would get. So a couple of other terms that um, you need to know, or that may be good for you to know, is uh, retrograde amnesia means um, not being able to remember things from the past, and anterior grade amnesia means having difficulty forming new memories. So there's some theories of forgetting. So the first one we're going to talk about is the trace decay theory. And what that means basically is that um, <clears throat> the longer it's been since that memory was stored, the more likely you are to forget it. And so that does explain why you don't have any memory for what happened to you when you were like really young. Um, but it also doesn't account for the fact that I don't even know what I did yesterday, but I do remember what happened when the trade towers fell down. At least I think I do. Uh, I know that I was in Miss Barnes English class in Charlotte, North Carolina at Providence High School. Uh, I definitely don't remember a lot of details about it, but I do remember it a little bit. And so that is called a flashbulb memory. And a flashbulb memory is like the idea that when a, when a really important event happens in history, we have these really vivid and detailed memory about what happened and what we were wearing and all these details about things that have happened and those memories tend to stay with us for a long period of time and so uh, that kind of refutes the idea of this trace decay theory because uh, tra trace decay is like well if if you know it's just the amount of time then it wouldn't explain this idea of flashbulb memories so this guy nicer was like you know I don't know I don't know about this whole flashbulb memory thing what I'm going to do is get a questionnaire, and when a flashbulb memory happens, I'm going to pass them out to my students. So Nicer and Harsh were ready for all this. They, um, the the uh, Challenger in 1992, which was a space shuttle, for those of you that are too young to remember this, I didn't remember it. I was like, I think six or seven, so I don't know why I said that. But um, it was, uh, the space shuttle went up in 1992, and it actually exploded, and all, and all the people on the space shuttle passed away, unfortunately. Um, they died of, you know, the impact of the shuttle. Um, and so, uh, Nicer and Harsh passed out this questionnaire after this, you know, really bad event happened. And they were asked what they were doing during that day. Um, and then they were also given the same questionnaire during a random day throughout the semester. And they were asked to um, fill out the same information about what happened during another random day during that semester. And then after three years passed, um, they asked the subjects to do the same thing again, to rate, uh, to, to try and remember all those things that they were doing during that past day. And what happened was that Nicer found that there was really no difference between the accuracy of the memories of the flashbulb memories of the the day where the flashbulb memory happened and the other random day throughout the member. And so one of the things that was consistent was that the people reported that their mem they were a lot more confident in their memories about what happened, even though they weren't as accurate. And so I think the big takeaway from NICER's study is that confidence in memory doesn't necessarily have to do with accuracy in memory. But that doesn't stop your lawyer from asking, from a trial lawyer, from asking a witness and saying, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you that you remember this? And they may say a 10 out of 10, and the jury may buy it, but just because they're confident doesn't mean the memory is accurate. At least that's what NICER's research says. Okay, so let's move on. So um, interference theory is perhaps a better theory. It's not perhaps. It is a better theory of um memories, right? So uh, interference means that other memories get in the way from you being able to get to access these memories, and that's why we forget. So uh, retroactive infer interference is when new memories interfere with your ability of getting older memories, and proactive interference is when old memories interfere with your ability or 
it, your ability to recall newer memories. And then there's this other theory called in, encoding specificity or encoding failure. And that means that you just weren't paying attention. So a lot of you guys that have no idea what I'm talking about and I'm watching this video right now and are like, what the fuck is he talking about? You would have an encoding failure. And you probably need to go back and watch the video again if you want to do well in your quiz. All right. So back to interference. Let's go talk about this. Um, I'm going to read a list of words out loud, and I want you to recall them after I read them. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Blanket, cup, fish, closed, cereal, spinach, leg, wallet, television, napkin, pencil, key, soap, tailor, sweatshirt, sword, basketball, nicotine, credit, failure, weight, cheese, anger, and cold. All right, so what I want you to do now is I want you to pause the video and try to recall as many of those words as you can. All right, so did you get any of the words? If you, okay, so write down the ones that you get. I'm going to flip it. Go ahead and document the ones you got. So did you recall any of these words? If you did, um, these are the last six words that I read. So the recency effect is the idea that you'll be more likely to recall words at the end of the list, in the middle of the list, and sometimes the beginning of the list, especially when there's no delay period between reading the list and the recall period. So um, if there's no delay period and immediately after the list you're asked to recall the words, you're going to be like, oh, these were the ones you just said, and so you're going to recall the words at the end of the list better. So that's the idea of, this, of the uh, recency effect. Did you recall any of these words? Okay, so these were the first six words that I read. And so the other half of the serial position effect is the primacy effect. And that's the, the idea that you're more likely to remember words at the beginning of the list than the middle or sometimes the end of the list. And it's more likely to happen compared to the, to the end of the list when there's a delay period between the, um, when the list is read and when you have to recall it. So if I were to recall this at the end, you know, ask you to recall it at the end, you may be more likely to recall the words at the beginning of the list. All right, so we're going to do a different task. What I want you to do right now is I want you to take these words and I'm going to give you about 20 seconds and I want you to put them into a sentence, as many of them as you can. All right. All right. Recall as many of the words from the list as you can right now. And you can pause it if I'm going too fast. All right. Did you recall any of these words? If you did, these were the words from the first list. Okay. So if you did, the older words interfered with your ability to recall the words from the second list. This is called proactive interference. Okay if this happened to you. Okay, so now try recalling the words from the first list again. Did you say any of these words? If you did, these were the words that were in the second list. So if the newer list interfered with your ability to recall words from the older list, then you had retroactive interference, okay? So um, one of the things that I asked you to do, so remember I asked you to put the words um, into a sentence, right? So um, did you recall more of these words than you did of the words in the first list? If the answer is yes, um, the reason why you did that is because you used the meaning of the words to help you remember them rather than just trying to repeat them over and over again. When you use the meaning of words to remember them, that is called deep processing, and it's associated with better um, memory for things than doing shallow processing, which is memorizing words for how they sound and things like that. All right, so we're moving along. So I want to tell, talk to you about a study by Golden and Badley. So Golden and Badley did this study where they had um, scuba divers that they could memorize a list of words either on land or underwater. And so group one 
um, studied uh, these words um, under, um, they studied the words on land and, took, and were tested um, for recall of the words on land. And then group number two studied underwater, took the test on land. Group three studied on land, took the test underwater. And then group four took the test, uh, studied underwater and took the test underwater. Group one and four scored the highest, remember the most words, because they studied in the same environment that they took the test. And so this is the idea of context-dependent memory. You're more likely to remember things in the same context. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple of studies in a minute um, that go over, um, that, that, that discuss these topics. So let's go here. So cigarette smoking. Um, so people are more likely to uh, remember information uh, when they, you know, smoke a cigarette when they're smoking cigarettes, right? It has a context-dependent memory. And this study was done by, um, conducted by Rogers and McGee. There's another um, research by Ike, McCauley, and Lamb that shows that people. Um, who uh, have bipolar disorder and uh, go through manic and depressed moods, when they're in a manic state, they're more likely to remember information in the manic state. And when they're in the depressed state, they're more likely to remember information in the depressed state. So when you're more likely to remember information because of the, in, in prior, when you're in a mood in the same, if you're in the same mood, you're more likely to remember information that happened when you were in that mood before. So that's called mood-dependent memory. So basically, if you're if you're doing if you're in the same environment um, that you study as when you take the test, research says that you're gonna do better on the test. So if you actually go into your classroom that you're gonna take the test in and take the test, and that's how you study, research suggests that you're gonna have the best recall for the information.